So how do we name this molecule? Well, we start with the longest carbon chain. So there are seven carbons in my longest carbon chain. So I would call this heptane. And I number it to give the substituent the lowest number possible. So in this example, it doesn't really matter if I start from the left or from the right. In both, in both examples, you would end up with a four for your substituent there. Now, this substituent looks different from ones we've seen before. There are three carbons in it, but those carbons are not in a straight chain alkyl group. So if I look at it, right, there are three carbons, but they're not, they're not going in a straight chain. They're branching of branching here. So this is kind of weird. How do we, how do we name this substituent? Well, down here, um, I have the same substituent, and I'm going to draw this little zigzag line to indicate that that substituent is coming off of some straight chain alkane. And when you're naming a complex substituent like this, you actually use the same rules that you would use for a straight chain alkane. So you first identify the longest carbon chain, which in this case is only two carbons. Right? So that would be an ethyl group coming off of my carbon chain. So I'm going to go ahead and name that as an ethyl group. Um, I'm going to go ahead and number it, right, to give, my, to give my branching group there the lowest number possible. So I go one and two. So what is my substituent coming off of my ethyl group? Well, that's a methyl group coming off of carbon one. So I name it as one methyl ethyl. Okay, so now that complex substituent is named as 1-methyl-ethyl. So I could go ahead and put that into my name. So coming off of carbon 4, I have 1-methyl-ethyl. I have one methyl ethyl. And I'm going to put that in parentheses. And all of that is coming off of carbon 4 for my molecule. So 4-1-methyl-ethyl-heptane would be the IUPAC, would be an acceptable IUPAC way of naming that molecule. So if you're naming your complex substituent as 1-methyl-ethyl, that's the official IUPAC way. But there are also common names for these complex substituents. So the common name for 1-methyl-ethyl is isopropyl. So iso propyl is the common name. And isopropyl is, is used so frequently that that it's it's perfectly acceptable to use isopropyl for the name of this molecule as well. So you could have said, oh, this is for isopropyl heptane, and you would have been absolutely correct. So that's yet another IUPAC name. So iso means same, and uh, it probably comes from the fact that you have these, these, two, these two methyl groups giving you this Y shape that are the same. So, uh, so that's a, one complex substituent, one that has three carbons on it. Let's look at a bunch of complex substituents that have a total of four carbons on them. So all all of these guys have a total of four carbons. And let's do that same trick with the zigzag line so we can ignore the rest of the molecule and just think about them as being alkyl groups. So how do I name these? The same steps. You find your longest carbon chain. So for this one, the longest carbon chain would be three. It's an alkyl group, so it's propyl. And when you number it, all right, this would get a one, this would get a two, and this would get a three. So you have a methyl group coming off of carbon one here. So it would be one methyl propyl as the name of that complex substituent. The common name for that is sec butyl. So butyl because there are a total of four carbons. Let's do the next one. So one, two, three again. So when I when I number it, one, two, three, I can see that it would be propyl once again. So I go ahead and write propyl here. And what is coming off of that group, right? Well, I have a, a methyl group coming off of carbon two this time. So it would be two methyl propyl. So two methyl propyl for this complex substituent. The common name for this is isobutyl. So butyl, again, because there are four total carbons in this complex substituent. Iso, because once again, you have these two methyl groups, so they're like the same, so you get that Y formation. So that's isobutyl. The next one, longest carbon chain. There are two carbons in my longest carbon chain. So that would be ethyl. And when I number my longest carbon chain, I can see that I have two methyl groups. And each of those methyl groups is coming off of carbon one. So I would say this would be one, one, dimethyl, ethyl. 
So 1,1-dimethylethyl would be the IUPAC name for for this complex substituent. You will also see tert-butyl. So tert-butyl is probably used even more frequently. So tert-butyl, again butyl because there are a total of four carbons here. So those are the three possibilities for a complex substituent with a total of four carbons. Let's look at just a few of the possibilities for complex substituents that have five carbons. They're actually much more than this, but these are the ones that are most commonly used. So let's just focus in on these two. So once again, we'll draw our zigzag line to represent the fact that this is actually connected to, to, some, to some straight chain alkane. And once again, we find our longest carbon chain, one, two, three, four. So that would be butyl. And when I number that carbon chain, one, two, three, four, I can see that I have a methyl group coming off of carbon three. So it would be three methyl butyl for the IUPAC name. And this is also called isopentyl. So you could say isopentyl, since there are five carbons now. Uh, an iso, because again, you have this methyl group and this methyl group looking like a Y. They're like the same thing. Or you've seen this, I've seen this called isoamyl before. So isoamyl or isopentyl are acceptable IUPAC names as well. What about this one on the right? Longest carbon chain, one, two, three. So that would be propyl. And numbering it one two three immediately it is obvious that you have two methyl groups coming off of carbon two so it would be two two dimethyl propyl otherwise known as neopentyl since once again you have five carbons for these so again there, there are many more and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll stop with those um, and so that gives you an idea about how to approach naming complex substituents. And of course, when you name complex substituents, you have to use them um, when you're naming straight chain or cycloalkane molecules. So let's look at a cycloalkane molecule and let's see how to name this guy. Well, I have four carbons in my ring and I have four carbons in this group. So tie goes to the cycloalkane. So remember from the last video, if you have an equal number of carbons in your, in your ring as with your, your chain, you're going to name it as an alkyl cycloalkane. The cycloalkane wins the tie. So there are four carbons, so this would be cyclobutane. So let's go ahead and write cyclobutane here. And once you've determined that you're going to name it as a cycloalkane, then you have to look at this complex substituent and say, Okay, well that's one, two, three. So that would be propyl. And then when you number, when you number that complex substituent, one, two, three, obviously there is a, a methyl group coming off of carbon one. So you would write one methyl propyl. So one methyl propyl. And if you wanted to, you could identify that one methylpropyl is coming off of carbon one of your cyclobutane. So you could put this in parentheses and write one one methylpropyl cyclobutane. Or you could just leave the one off and say one methylpropyl cyclobutane because again it is implied. What is the common name for for this complex substituent? So one methylpropyl, we go back up here and we find one methylpropyl was also called um, secbutyl. Okay, so we could have also have named this molecule uh, secbutyl cyclobutane. So let's go ahead and write that. So secbutyl cyclobutane is a perfectly acceptable IUPAC name as well. So it just depends. Do you do you want to do it the official IUPAC way, or do you want to memorize some of these common names? Let's do one more thing in this video. Let's let's classify carbons. Okay, so we're going to do something called classification of carbons. This is a topic that comes up over and over again throughout an organic chemistry course. So the earlier you learn this concept, the better off you are. So classification of carbons. So let's say I have carbon connected to three hydrogens, and then I also have it connected to one other carbon in some R group. I want to know how to classify this carbon. So this carbon is connected to one other carbon, so therefore we say it is primary. So that is a primary carbon right there. 
Let's take off one of the hydrogens and let's put on another R group. So I'll make it R prime to distinguish it from the first R group. So this time, if I wanted to know the classification of this carbon, it's connected to two other carbons. So it is said to be secondary. So it is a secondary carbon like that. And I'm going to, once again, take off one of the hydrogens. So I'll make it an R double prime group. And now, if I wanted to classify my central carbon, now this is connected to one, two, three other carbons. So it is said to be tertiary. So that is a tertiary carbon like that. And uh, finally, I have one more example, of course. I take off the last hydrogen. So now I have R, R prime, R double prime, and R triple prime. So what is the classification? of this carbon now connected to four other carbons. So it is said to be quaternary. So that is a that is a quaternary carbon right here. So so quaternary. Alright, so if I'm trying to think about what where some of these common names come from, right, I can see, oh well well right here, uh right here I have if carbon's bonded to two other carbons, well, that would be secondary, right? So uh, S-E-C for my prefix. So let's go back up here and, and let's see if we can, we can find those examples, right? So here I have this carbon bonded to two other carbons. So this carbon was said to be secondary. So I think that's where this comes from. I've never seen that explained in a textbook or, or anywhere, but it just makes sense. So it's ignoring the fact that this carbon is actually attached to a ring. It's saying this carbon carbon on my complex substituent is bonded to two other carbons so it is secondary on that complex on that complex substituent what about what about tertiary right so par carbon bonded to three other carbons is said to be tertiary so if i go back up here again i can say well that would make sense because if i look at this carbon it's bonded to three other carbons right so i could say that is a tertiary carbon and once again, I'm ignoring the fact that this carbon is actually bonded to another carbon on the ring. Okay, so if you just look at the complex substituent, that carbon is said to be tertiary, which is I'm, I think is where the name comes from. Let's do let's do one more example of assigning complex um, of assigning classification of carbons to this molecule. So let's let's look at this carbon right here. This carbon is bonded to one other carbon and three hydrogens. So this carbon is said to be primary. This carbon right here is bonded to two other carbons, so it is said to be secondary. This carbon right here is bonded to three other carbons, so it is tertiary. This carbon is bonded to one other carbon, so it is primary. This carbon is bonded to three other carbons, so it is tertiary. And all of the carbons on the ring right here are bonded to two other carbons, so they are all said to be secondary. So that's a very important skill to develop, uh, classifying your carbons. Again, this will come up in future videos with different functional groups.